Good evening. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Neil Chase, the CEO at Cal Matters. This is uh, Props to You, the fifth and final event in our series about the 2020 election and the proposition on California's ballot, this, the, all 12 propositions on California's ballot this year. Tonight, we're going to look at three of those propositions, three propositions that Californians saw in previous ballots in recent years and are, that are back again this year for a yes or no vote. The first one is Prop 14, which has voters weighing whether to approve billions of taxpayer dollars to fund more stem cell research. Prop 23 focuses on whether or not to further regulate California's kidney dialysis industry. And Prop 21 will have voters revisit a decision on rent control after a similar measure was rejected two years ago. In these Props to You discussions, we're taking questions directly from you, the voters, and asking your questions directly to the people who know these propositions, propositions inside and out about what the impact of a yes or no vote would mean for Californians. We've written extensively about this, about California's propositions and the election in general, the races to watch. We've created a voter guide that's easy to follow that you can use easily on our website. Um, that along with what you've learned tonight will help you make informed decisions when you're filling out your ballot. The, uh, the guide and all of our coverage is available at calmatters.org. And while you're there, if you would please take a minute to consider becoming a subscriber to our newsletters. Um, or becoming a donor. If as, as a donor, you support our nonprofit, nonpartisan journalism, and we can't do this without you. So if, you're, if you like what you see tonight, and if it's useful, please consider supporting us with, uh, with a donation. One of the best things we've done to cover the election this year is our Propositions in a Minute videos, in which we do just that, give a short, concise summary of a proposition, each proposition, in about a minute. Um, we're going to start off each one of these discussions tonight with the video that explains it. So let's start off the first one with the video for Proposition 14, and then our moderator, Barbara Fader Ostrov, will begin the Q&A. Thanks again for joining us. 2004 was the year of promise for stem cell research using human embryos. To vote yes on Proposition 71, the Stem Cell Research Initiative. A human being begins as an embryo made up of a starter kit of stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are blank slates, not yet specialized and thus uniquely useful to researchers. When scientists learned how to remove stem cells from human embryos, it became a flashpoint in American politics. The ethical objection, researchers destroy lab-created human embryos for in vitro fertilization to retrieve embryonic stem cells and their life-saving potential. The federal government stopped research on newly created embryonic stem cell lines. California voters responded, touting possible cures for paralysis, Parkinson's, and other diseases, Californians put $3 billion towards stem cell research. Now, voters are being asked to fund more stem cell research. This time, it's Prop 14. Hi, I'm Baronda Lyons, video journalist for Cal Matters, and I'm explaining Proposition 14 in less than a minute. In 2001, then-President George W. Bush banned federal funding for research using newly created embryonic stem cell lines. In a backlash, California voters approved a state bond measure to fund stem cell research and create the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Bonds are loans. The state borrows money from investors and taxpayers pay it back over time with interest. In the past 14 years, the agency has funded 64 clinical trials and more than 3,000 scientific articles about stem cell research. Now, the agency is running out of money and asking voters for another $5.5 billion. The money would pay for more research, medical training, and building research facilities. Supporters say the Institute needs more money to keep working towards cures for diseases. Opponents say there is no longer federal limits on stem cell research, which was the whole genesis of the state getting involved anyway. Vote yes if you want California to keep funding stem cell research. Vote no if you don't. Learn more about these propositions and others at calmatters.org. For Cal Matters, I'm Baronda Lyons. Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Fader Ostrov, and I write about health policy for Cal Matters, and I'll be your moderator for the Q&A about Prop 14. You just saw the summary of it in your video explainer. Now we're going to talk for the next 15 to 20 minutes in more detail about what will happen if you vote no or yes on Prop 14. Joining us tonight to answer questions are two people who represent the net yes and no sides of Prop 14. On the yes side is Robert Klein, chair of the Yes on Proposition 14 campaign, who is also 
the main proponent and funder of Prop 71, which, as you saw in our video explainer, got video, uh, sorry, voter approval in 2004 for three billion dollars in bonds to fund stem cell research and established the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine to administer research grants. On the no side is Jeff Sheehy, board member of the aforementioned California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Robert and Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. As Neil mentioned, this is a Q&A and not a debate. The goal is for me to ask voters questions we received directly to Jeff and Robert, and for Jeff and Robert to answer those questions as succinctly as possible without jargon. Gentlemen, you'll each be able to respond to the questions asked. This is an opportunity to address the voters rather than debating one another. To make sure we stick to that, a few guidelines. I'm gonna ask you both a total of four questions. However, viewers, if you've got a question of your own, uh, write them in the uh, ask a question box uh, in the chat. If there's time for a fifth question, I get to do moderator's choice and select a question from our live audience to ask our two speakers. Robert and Jeff, for each of these four to five questions, you each get two minutes to respond directly to the voters question. And remember that our event team will ping you with the 30 seconds left alert so that you know it's time to wrap it up. If you feel so inclined to rebut something that the other person said you can, but keep in mind that your rebuttal will be part of the total two minutes to answer the question. So really the goal is to talk to voters and answer the question they have rather than refuting or defending positions against the other speaker. I'll let Robert go first in answering two of the questions and I'll let Jeff go first when answering the other two questions. If we get to the fifth moderator's choice questions, I might just ask you to pick another number between one and 10 to see who answers that one first. And everyone, please stick around until the end. We're going to do an insta poll after the Q&A and see how you would vote on Prop 14 based on what you just heard. All right, let's go to the first question. Fern B asks, I can't afford more taxes. I'm all for research, but when it comes comes time for me needing that research to help me, I'll have to pay for it again. Why not let investors pay for this and do a startup approach to it? Robert? Uh, thank you, Barbara. So what's critical to understand here is there are no new taxes generated uh, from Prop 14. Prop 14 also has no payments from the state general fund in, for six years. It's 2026 before there's a payment so it acts as a stimulus, creating 100,000 uh, new jobs with new revenues during the recovery period from COVID-19, helping us with our recovery. And the revenue from that should be sufficient to carry us through about the 12th year, starting with year six, which is the first payment through year 12. What's critical to also understand is that in the outer years, uh, we expect medical uh, savings because like a young man who is in numerous people with paralysis are in our trials, we can show with a proof of concept that they can, with one shot of 10 million stem cells, oleodendrocytes, they can recover uh, their upper body function significantly, become re-engaged with the society instead of being quadriplegics, cared for by the state for 30 years when their families go bankrupt. There's huge savings from early interventions. and in the outer years, it is the state is only paying $5 on average per person uh, for this research as versus $300 billion we pay for chronic illness uh, and injury in California, $300 billion versus $5, which is the cost of a bottle of aspirin. It's critical to understand too, this is a patient advocate driven initiative where, where 90 patient advocate organizations, the American Diabetes Association, the American Cancer Researchers, uh, the uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research, the, um, the American uh, Association for Epilepsy, the American Association for Alzheimer's, the LA Association for Al Alzheimer's, the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, 90 different patient advocate organizations have endorsed this after vetting it with their scientific committee. This is how in the nation they feel they have the best chance of getting their therapies through uh, to the public. Okay, Jeff? Sure, thank you, Barbara. And I think this is a great question. 
You know, I support stem cell research and I've been on the board of this agency since the beginning. And I think we've done good work. But the reality is, is this was never supposed to be paid for forever with debt. And currently we're paying $327 million a year. That's according to a letter from the legislative analyst to the attorney general, Xavier, Javier Becerra, dated December 19th of 2017 when this ballot measure was first uh, submitted. The reality is, is these debt payments are paid before any general fund expenditure is made. Debt is paid first. So before a teacher gets paid, before a nurse get, gets paid, before money goes to fight wildfires, we're paying down this debt. If you look at your ballot handbook, this additional money will cost us $260 million a year for the next 30 years. Again, this will be debt that will be paid before any general fund activity happens. We do not need to spend this money. The federal government is spending $2.1 billion this year on uh, stem cell research. The federal ban is gone. You go to NIH categorical spending, you type that into Google and you will look and you will see how much the federal government spends on stem cell research. The reality is, is that the biomedical uh, sector of our economy is well-funded. COVID is pouring money for every, uh, every uh, organ system uh, for, I mean, this is not where our problem is. We have problems getting kids in school. We have problems making sure everyone has access to healthcare. Great, next question. Dalen Johnson asks, what have you done in the past years since Prop 71 was approved? Just curious, I'm wondering what you've learned so far. Robert? Robert, please unmute yourself. Thank you. There Thank you go. Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> what we've learned is we have 3,000 published medical discoveries. California is number two in the world in biomedical research capacity when ranked as a nation. It is only second uh, to the United States. And then the numbers that Jeff quotes are for the entire nation for biomedical research. In California, we only have $350 million a year from the federal government, from the NIH, and they will not fund any, any, zero clinical trials if it's an embryonically derived therapy. My youngest son died with type one diabetes. The th only therapy that's in, that is available that is in phase two clinical trials showing dramatic proof is from embryonic stem cells. We cannot get funding from the federal government, from the NIH, it's only California. The same thing with age-related blindness that, that covers 50% of seniors between 65 and 85 that, de that develop some degree of blindness. It's the same thing with paralysis. These are embryonically derived therapies. On September 4th, as the opposition knows, the, the 22 US senators wrote to uh, Trump to try and re override the Obama executive order that allowed this research, even the research to go forward. Uh, and as he knows, even if Trump doesn't uh, approve this override, that these 22 senators voting as a block can impose through a 60% vote required in the Senate for appropriations, an amendment that bans this research. We're in the same place we were with Bush. It's just, it hasn't been publicized. We have the letter, you've got the letter, we've sent it to you and he's got the letter. We know where this is going. These therapies are life-saving therapies. My youngest son died waiting for the federal government. The funds are not available. Chad? Sure, Barbara. Uh, the reality is, is the federal government is amply funding human embryonic stem cell research to the tune of $300 million this year. Again, go to NIH categorical spending, type it into Google and scroll down to stem cell research, human embryonic, and you'll see that they've been spending ample money the reality is, is embryonic stem cells are not where the science is right now. The science is focused on gene therapy, CRISPR. We have treatments for cancer now, CAR T cells that are commercial ventures. That's where the science is. And, and the idea that Trump is going to stop embryonic stem cell research, well, you know what? 
they had the House, they had the Senate, and they had the presidency. That didn't happen. We are not where we were in 2004. But to answer the, the, uh, the, the, the question itself, I'm proud of the work that CIRM's done. They moved the ball forward. This has been important. We've done the job. For once, can government go and do the job they said they were going to do? And then let's use the money for the needs we have right now. The federal government is funding this, these needs. Our kids are, are not in school. Why? Because we don't have the money for everything we need to get our kids back into public schools. We see huge disparities in outcomes with COVID. And why? Not everyone has access to, to the appropriate level of health care. And, and let's focus and look at the wildfires tearing this state apart. And to add, the whole state budget is based on getting recovery funds from, that, from Congress, which we just learned today is not going to happen. All right, third question. Um, Amanda Bobbitt asks, I know Trump took a treatment that was developed from stem cells. Can this funding help with COVID-19 research? Robert? Well, as we've seen in the news coverage last year, Trump effectively banned uh, the uh, use of fetal tissue, which was used for these two therapies that he took. Uh, we, he banned it, it's, it's done. And so to say that they're not going to move forward and answer these conservative core voters for Trump with an action against embryonic stem cell research is really uh, a non sequitur. But what's more important is he is ignoring the opposition. Jeff is totally ignoring the fact that he knows they don't fund clinical trials for embryonic stem cells. And he also knows that this agency funds genetic uh, therapies in conjunction with stem cells like CRISPR and combining it with, with type one di uh, diabetes. He also knows that <laughs> immune tolerance is being, uh, being created for transplants related to kidneys and, and other organs using CRISPR with stem cell research. And he knows that 50% of all the major funding, uh, all the government funding for our research hospitals, our re major research institutions, whether it's UCLA or UC Davis or UC San Francisco uh, <laughs> is from the California Initiative. Without this, 50% of their funding goes away. The alpha clinics that have these leading clinical trials where there's 94 clinical trials, there are 67 clinical trials funded by the agency, another 30 funded by biotech on agency research. This all goes away and collapses. We have the world's leading effort in stem cell therapies for the benefit of California. We are going to lose it unless we act and retain this precious right. This is why the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Women's Association for Cancer Research, the American Association for Cancer uh, Researchers have all endorsed it and signed the ballot. Yeah. Sure. Um, so to answer the reader's question, you know, stem cells are really not the answer for COVID. Uh, it is important, and this research is ongoing, using fetal stem, stem cells to create humanized uh, animal models, such as mice, where they test vaccines and antivirals. We did a round of research at CIRM for COVID, and I have to say, we did not see very many good projects. The best project that we funded was for uh, uh, the, uh, the convalescent plasma, which you've heard about, which is a hundred year old technology, um, which uh, didn't involve stem cells at all. And that was probably the best project we funded. In general, I, you know, I think these scare tactics are just not appropriate. And I think we should try to stay within the realm of truth. And I think personal attacks are not really appropriate. I think really the question is, do we, do we have other needs in the state? Should we let the legislature, and I agree with the LA Times and the San Francisco Chronicle and the San Jose Mercury News, that this should go through the legislature, that this need should be balanced against other needs like education and healthcare and housing, and that we should do this for the normal process. Why this program is, gets to be funded with debt that we will be paying off for 30 years, it makes no sense to me. 
Great. Okay, with our um, next question, we're going to start with Jeff. Um, this question is from Evan Swordfager. Uh, what will happen to the research already in progress if Prop 14 doesn't pass? Will it stop? We'll start with Jeff. No, it will not. The funding for the research that we were doing will continue. And I just want to note that the, the federal government spending in this and the, and the spending in general in this field is enormous, right? Uh, and I just want to bring up one. When you start talking about all these diseases we're going to miraculously cure, you know, we had Nancy Reagan and we said we cure Alzheimer's. So out of that $3 billion, we spent $30 million. That's all. We do not have a clinical trial in Alzheimer's. If you go to UCSF's website and click in clinical trials, Alzheimer's, you'll see 20 clinical trials. You know, the Chuck, the Mark Zuckerberg and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, other philanthropists are pouring money into biomedical research, which I think is great. I applaud them for doing so. But the idea that California, there's no one else who's going to pay for te pay teachers here. There's no one else who's going to pay, pay uh, nurses and do public health in California. No one else is going to fight our fires for us. And I say this, I have spent 16 years on the board of this agency. Again, I say we've done fabulous work. We did the job we said we would do, but no one imagined 16 years ago that we would pay for this forever with debt. And at some point we have to be fiscally responsible. We can support stem cell research without, you know, we may have the next Nobel prize winner sitting at home waiting for a Zoom to click in because he or she doesn't have access to internet. I mean, I hear people sitting outside Starbucks or other places so they can access the internet. And these are kids. Robert. So it's critical here that we stick, stick with the facts. Uh, uh, it's really important to understand that the treasurer of the state of California in July 2020 and clear updated figures that Jeff ignores said the payments, uh, the bond payments are half of what he said. Uh, Jeff is just purposely and intentionally misrepresenting to the, to, to the public. The governor has endorsed this after going through with his finance uh, committee, the chambers of co commerce from Sacramento through San Francisco to LA to San Diego have endorsed this. Patient advocacy, 90 different patient advocacy groups. Do we think that they're all wrong? Uh, why would they go through their scientific committee and their legal committees and endorse this? There is no payment on this for uh, six years. There's not a dollar that'll come out of education. And Jeff knows from the USC report that there are 56,000 jobs produced on the last initiative projected for 100,000 jobs on the new initiative. The revenues from those will pay for the payments through your 11 or 12. Think of the lives that we can save by leading the world with this research as the second well, the second greatest biomedical capacity in the world. Uh, you know, there's no more reason for children to unnecessarily die. To say that the NIH is funding enough when 50% of all the California funding from government is from the California agency. Uh, these institutions, the institutes, the center of excellence, the alpha clinics will be shut down. Jeff knows that. Uh, he is intentionally misrepresenting this. Uh, He's put himself on a limb he can't climb back off of. The governor took a lot of, uh, of interest in this. He has since he was mayor of San Francisco and then lieutenant governor. And he has endorsed this because he's looked at the numbers. The numbers work for California. Great. Okay, if we can do one more question really quick, I'm going to arbitrarily have Robert go first. And that question is from Lynn Bell. Uh, will California reap any monetary gains from this research? Do Californians own the treatments? Go ahead, Robert. Uh, it's key from the very beginning in what we sent to the legislative analysts, what was <clears throat> the, the argument is that the biggest gain to California is reducing human suffering and restoring health. The, on the financial side, which is not our primary mission, which is to create new therapies to reduce the suffering of Californians from chronic disease, 
But on the financial side, the major benefit was when we get through the FDA trials, we start saving money. All the FDA trials that go on are free to Californians participating, all 94 of them. When we get to, to, to savings, think of that young man, 21 years old in a car accident, fully paralyzed, his parents are spoon feeding him to keep him alive. He would be on public welfare after his family went bankrupt for 30 years with no quality of life. Think of the savings by an early intervention therapy that restores his life to an independence with integrity where he can contribute to the society. Early intervention therapies in cancer that are 90 day, 90 day treatments, not 10 year treatments like my wife had when she went through cancer. These early intervention therapies from stem cells and genetics work in with stem cells have a revolution in medicine in how we treat medicine and reducing the suffering and restoring health. The potential is ours. California is the only place in the country that can do this. This is our time to act. Uh, we are in extraordinary times and we have seen with COVID when we didn't uh, invest uh, in science, uh, when we didn't follow science, what happened? The medical societies of this country, the patient advocacy groups of this country have endorsed California for having an outstanding program. As Jeff okay. said, Robert, I'm going to have you turn it over to Jeff because we're running real short on time now. Okay. Uh, Jeff, real short summary, and then I'll wrap it up. Sure. Well, I just want to. I just want to go to one point. Uh, this idea that CIRM is spending, providing half the money to institutions is simply not true. I quote from a press release from the University of California, San Francisco. The university was awarded uh, 1,300 NIH grants and contracts amounting to more than 684 million in funding. So I think that the idea that the NIH is not putting, and that was on an annual basis, ample money into this is not, it's just a myth. The other thing is, is one of the biggest problems with the new measures, it makes it impossible for the treasury to get the money back that we're spending. Right now, after spending 300 billion, after spending $3 billion, billion we've received less than 500,000 in return. And the new measure doesn't even allow us to get a return. It says that any money that we get back in return for producing these products has to go back to the manufacturers to subsidize those treatments. So this Jeff, thing I'm going to have you wrap it up there because we're really out of time. Voters, uh, take the Zoom poll uh, here. Vote yes or no or undecided on Prop 14 right now, and let's see if it would pass or not. We'll see the results during the rest break before the Q&A for Prop 23 starts. Robert and Jeff, thank you very much for taking the time to answer these questions in an easy to understand way and help us understand this proposition better. Stick around. We'll be back shortly with part two on Proposition 23. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ana Ibarra, healthcare reporter for CalMatters, and welcome to the next part of the show. This is a Q&A about Proposition 23. So let's kick it off with the Proposition Explained in One Minute video, and I'll give you the summary there. 
They say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And that's what One Health Workers Union is doing. Two years ago, Californians voted against a ballot measure that would have limited the profits of kidney dialysis companies. Fast forward, Californians are now being asked to vote on yet another dialysis proposition. Hi, I'm Cal Matters health reporter Ana Ibarra, and this is Prop 23 in a minute. Prop 23 is not so much about capping profits as it is about adding regulations, although these may come at a cost to clinics, which serve about 80,000 Californians with kidney failure. The measure would require clinics to have at least one physician on site during operating hours. It would also mandate that clinics report infection data to the state get state approval before closing a clinic, and prohibit clinics from discriminating against patients based on their insurance type. Supporters, led by the labor union SEIU United Health Workers, say dialysis companies need to be held accountable and that the proposed requirements would improve patient services. Opponents, led by dialysis companies, argue this is another attempt by the labor group to pressure clinics and unionize dialysis workers. Plus, they say clinics already have the necessary medical staff on site. Hiring additional doctors would raise clinic costs, leading some clinics to cut their hours or shut down, stranding people who need dialysis treatment to survive. So vote yes if you want the state to add more requirements for dialysis clinics. Vote no if you don't. Oh my God. Okay. So. Okay. So we'll be using the same Q&A format as Barbara did with her talk on Prop 14. Um, I'll start by introducing two people, uh, both uh, dialysis patients, and but they're on different sides of Prop 23. So on the yes side, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Carmen Cartagena, a kidney dialysis patient in Concord. And on the no side, we have Mr. Dwayne Cox, a dialysis patient in Los Angeles. And so uh, as a reminder of uh, the Q&A discussion guidelines, I'm going to ask you both four questions. If there's time for a fifth question, I get to do moderator's choice and select a question from our live audience. So viewers, uh, write your questions in the chat box if you have one. Uh, Carmen and Duane, for each of these questions, you both get two minutes to respond directly to the question. Um, and if you feel so inclined to rebut uh, something that the other person said, you can, but keep in mind that your rebuttal will be part of the total two minutes to answer the question. So uh, we ideally wanna use those two minutes to answer the, the question I asked. So um, keep that in mind. And everyone will do another Insta poll after the Q&A to see how you would vote on Prop 23 based on what you just heard. All right, so let's do the first question. And so thank you both for being here, Dwayne and Carmen. Um, I know a lot of people want to hear from dialysis patients themselves. So let's start with why are you in support or against Prop 23? And how did your own experience with dialysis clinics influence your position? Carmen, let's start with you. Hi, my name is Carmen Cartagena. I'm a 12 year dialysis patient and I am for Prop 23, because like I said, I've been a patient for 12 years and I've seen the quality of care diminish since then. I have um, been exposed to infections that have landed me in the hospital, um, dirty clinics, flies. Um, a lot of patients pass out, you know, we, we lose consciousness. And I believe that having a doctor on site is going to save lives. So for me personally, as a patient, Prop 23 is something that I feel is going to not only save my life, but save patients' lives and give us better care and prevent us from the infection rates. Dwayne. Hi, my name is Dwayne Cox. Um, I've been on dialysis for 10 years uh, in Van Nuys. And I am... Um, very much opposed to Proposition 23. Uh, I, for the two main reasons, is that I think it's that the having a doctor there uh, every hour is unnecessary. Um, I have uh, my nephrologist who visits me at the dialysis center every week. Every patient there, if there are 100 patients in the center, they also have a nephrologist who meets them there every week. Um, the physician that would have to be there does not have to be a kidney specialist. 
could be a dermatologist or a podiatrist. Uh, and they would not be involved in patient care. They would primarily be um, bureaucrats who are um, spending time pushing papers and uh, pretty much checking their, um, their stock reports. Um, the most important thing about that though is that if that happens, those costs would cause dialysis centers to, some of them would uh, make severe cuts, some of them would close, and some of them will cut shifts and, um, and staffing. And that would mean that patients would have to go someplace else. And if a patient has to end up going to an emergency room instead of going to their dialysis center or missing a session, it could be deadly. I know because I missed a dialysis session on a Friday because of work. Uh, I ended up going to the emergency room on that Saturday. Uh, it's a great emergency room, but they didn't know how to take care of dialysis patients. And um, because of the poor care, um, I ended up in ICU um, and nearly losing my life because of the, uh, the way they tried to treat me. So I know how deadly it can be for uh, dialysis patients if we miss a session or if uh, one of our centers is closed and we have to go someplace else and uh, we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. So let's go to our first question from the chat box. This is from Lori Ludwig. She asks, why is an MD needed uh, to administrate reports, why can't a nurse or pr practitioner or a clerk prepare the state reports? And that seems to be one of the most asked questions, I think, of this proposition. Um, you know, why do we need a physician on site? Um, uh, let's start, or why do we need one or why don't we need one? Let's start now with you, DeWayne, to alternate. Okay, uh, the answer to that question is we don't. We have a licensed physician who, who acts as the medical director in every clinic that is mandated by um, the federal government and the state of California. Uh, we have, at any given time, there are four to five registered kidney nurses uh, at my clinic who are there to administer help and, um, and overall care, as well as the technicians. Um, so I know the reason I do dialysis in center rather than at home is because I know that if emergency pops up or uh, if I need ongoing uh, specialized care is that my, uh, the technicians and uh, nurses and doctors that are there at the center are going to give me what I need. Okay, Carmen. Okay, thank you. All right, well, um, first of all, it doesn't have to be a dermatologist or anything else. If they cannot find a doctor that, you know, can work in the clinic, they can apply for an exep exception. In that case, a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant can take the place of the doctor. Okay. Um, and as a dialysis patient, like I told you, having a doctor on site, you know, um, will definitely prevent deaths. Also, um, the facilities are already cutting costs, cutting shifts and taking shortcuts on everything, you know, they're in the hospital, in the clinic, I'm sorry. And they can very well afford what we're asking for. Okay, these, these clinics make four times more than a regular hospital. There is nothing in our um, proposition that we are asking for that they cannot afford. And having a doctor on site, you know, I'm glad that Dwayne has a great clinic I mean, having four nurses on his site is amazing. Yeah, I'm lucky if I have two, right. okay? And we are short staff, not all clinics. You're fortunate, I'm not. So we're taking care of all clinics, not just the ones that we are at where we're happy and everything's taken care of. This is to ensure equal care for all patients in dialysis. Can I answer? Well, we can, you can use your next two minutes to address okay. that. But I okay. did want to move on to the third question. Um, and this is actually came from a comment from um, a, uh, a YouTube chat box from the video explainer we did. And Harry Robles wrote this. Um, 
I work as a paramedic and constantly respond to 911 calls at these dialysis clinics. Staff can never give an accurate report on a patient's history and chief complaint. Oftentimes, staff fails to identify if a patient is sick and doesn't call 911 until the patient is critical and in need of immediate medical attention. Um, they simply hand us a printout of the patient's medical history and walk away, leaving EMS personnel to figure out what's wrong with the patient. Obviously, that's you know one person's um, experience as a um, uh, uh, paramedic, but I'm wondering if you know if this sounds common to you, and do you think it signals a lapse of, of patient care? So uh, this time we'll start with with Carmen. Uh, yes, I definitely agree with that. Um, I had an incident just happen at my clinic last week where we had that and I happened to be in the lobby when they were taking out the patient and I overheard the ambulance driver complaining because they had no idea what had happened other than that the patient had fallen down and that was all the information that they had been given and they couldn't understand why they had to take this patient to emergency. Um, I'm sorry, did I answer the question? I tend to get sidetracked a little bit. Can you please repeat what you wanted me to answer for you? Yes, I will. I was reading Harry's comment and I wanted to see if that was something that you'd seen, if it was common to you. Yes, aside from last week's situation, which is, you know, the, the earliest situation. Yes, it's very common in my clinic. Okay. And I'm sure it's very common in all clinics. I mean, you know, they're nurses. They're not doctors. They can't, you know, diagnose what's wrong with you. I myself got taken to the hospital because my blood pressure was high. They didn't realize that I was stroking. So yes, a doctor would save lives. A doctor is very much needed and a doctor is needed so they can explain to ambulance drivers why they're calling for us patients to be taken out by ambulance. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Duane, would you like to answer if you've seen that, if that's common at your clinic? I would like to answer that. Uh, and no, uh, it is not common at my clinic. Uh, the thing is, is that, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, th they say that it has to be a licensed physician, but um, there is a uh, severe physician shortage already uh, in California, and uh, specifically a uh, nephrologist, because unfortunately, um, kidney failure is uh, growing. It grows by 5% every year. So um, uh, kidney doctors are, uh, are very hard to come by. And then, um, as I said, if a, if a doctor isn't specifically trained in that area, it can cost the patient his life. When I went to the emergency room, um, they said my potassium was a little high, so they gave me caxolate, which is normal. But unfortunately, the doctor said, okay, well, we have to give you insulin to go along with that because it's a sugar-based uh, solution that you take orally. Well, I'm not diabetic. I've never had insulin before in my life. So my um, blood sugar dropped down to 20. And then they start giving me sucrose uh, intravenously, and it caused my... Uh, blood um, sugar to run up to 400. And so now I'm on a, a, a lightning uh, rod of uh, a roller coaster and I'm chasing my blood sugar. And it nearly killed me. I mean, it literally nearly killed me. So uh, a lot of patients wouldn't have come back from that. And and that's why we it, this bill was just poorly written. It should have specified what type of doctor. It also is like taking a machete to where you need a scalpel because there are lots of clinics that have great outcomes and great treatment. Um, and those that have trouble, they need to be excised. They need to be addressed and fixed, but not across the board where you put so many patients in danger. And then it's like Russian roulette if some of these places close and they start cutting ships. Thank you, Duane. So, whoa, I went dark. Um, so the next question is from Allison Taub, and we also just, um, we got this from our YouTube chat page or comment section, and she asked, do clinics refuse certain types of insurance? What does that mean? Is that Medi-Cal? If insurance discriminate, um, if insurance discrimination is a problem, why doesn't the state legislate about it? Like many voters, I feel like I don't know anything about the dialysis world. Why am I being asked to step in and regulate it when we have a state legislature to do that? So, uh, Dewayne, I'll start this one with you. Okay. Um, 
first, um, I'll address what you just said, Anna, is that dialysis is very specialized. And most people have no idea what dialysis is. Most people don't even have any idea what their kidneys are, what they do. Um, and so uh, when you put legislation like this on the ballot uh, for the general public to make decisions that can be life or death um, for dialysis patients, it's extremely dangerous, it's wrong, and it is a, um, it is a tactic by SEIU to try to pressure the dialysis uh, centers into opening up their doors to the unions um, to organize their staff. So the problem is, is that patients like me and Carmen, honestly, get caught in the middle. And uh, it's uh, it, it infuriates me because they did the same thing two years ago. And when they lost that badly, they said, okay, we'll be back in two years with another one. Let's stop this. Thank you, Duane. Carmen? You're welcome. Okay. Um, so first, let me go back and readdress that thing about the doctors. Again, we are not, if they cannot get a doctor, they can file for an exception, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant, okay? And as far as this being a union thing, this is about patient care and improving the quality of care for patients like myself, patients like Dwayne, and patients that don't have the privilege of having better clinics like Dwayne and I. This campaign is led by dialysis patients and dialysis workers, okay? The, op the um, opposition is led by the dialysis industry and interested parties with a campaign budget of over $100 million. So it's about their profits, okay? Nothing we have asked for, again, they cannot afford. So if they don't care about patients, which they have shown, then we're going to keep fighting them. I, as a patient, am going to keep fighting them because I want good care in my clinic. I want my staff to not have to be overworked. I want my clinic to be fully staffed. And I want my nurses not to have to work as dialysis patients because they can't get enough people in there. They can hire people. They choose not to. They've got the money. They choose not to. It's profit over patients, and that's what we're trying to change. Patients first. Thank you, Carmen. So that brings us to the end of our questions. So voters, take the Zoom poll here. Vote yes or no, or I'm not sure on Prop 23 uh, right now, and let's see if it would pass or not. Uh, we'll see the results on the screen before we move to the next part of the event. So Carmen and Duane, thank you so much again for taking the time to answer these questions and for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. Thank you. And stick around, we'll be back uh, with last but not least, a Q&A about Prop 21 and rent control in California.
Hey everyone, thanks for sticking around. I'm Jackie Botts, economic inequality reporter for Cal Matters, and welcome to the final part of our event, a Q&A about Proposition 21 and rent control in California. Uh, let's kick it off with the proposition explained in one minute video. This fall, you'll start going through your ballot and see rent control. Sound familiar? There's my colleague, Matt, talking about the same proposal back in 2018. 59% of Californians voted against it. So I'm sure you're wondering what's new this time. I'll explain. Hi, I'm Jackie Botts, and I cover economic inequality for Cal Matters. I'll explain Prop 21 in under a minute. California renters typically pay 70% more than renters in other states. It's one of the big reasons nearly 150,000 Californians are unhoused. Last year, California lawmakers passed a state law capping yearly rent increases at around 8% for most housing. Some people think the state law doesn't go far enough, which brings us to Prop 21. Some cities have their own rent control laws, but their power is limited. For example, cities can't enact rent control laws for single-family homes. But Prop 21 would allow cities to enact stricter rent control for almost all rental housing, as long as it's more than 15 years old. Supporters say this will prevent more homelessness and gentrification. Opponents say stricter local rent control will make it unprofitable for landlords to build more housing, which we so desperately need. Plus, California voters already nixed this idea in 2018. On the other hand, the pandemic's financial shock could make people more eager to protect renters. Vote yes on Prop 21 if you want your city to be able to expand rent control. Vote no on Prop 21 if you don't. For more information on Prop 21 and everything on the November ballot, visit calmatters.org. Okay, you saw the summary of what Proposition 21 is about. Uh, joining us to discuss it in more detail is Renee Moya, chair of the Yes on Prop 21 campaign, and Deborah Carlton, executive vice president of state government affairs and compliance for the California Apartment Association, which is against Prop 21. We've got 15 to 20 minutes for this discussion, so please do get in as many questions and answers uh, uh, as we can during that time. We'll follow the same guidelines as the other two Q&A segments before us. So Renee and Deborah, I have four questions to ask you. You each have two minutes to respond directly to the question. Remember that our event team will ping you at a 30 second left alert so you know it's time to wrap it up. And I'll also let you know when you've reached the two minute mark and it's time for the other person to speak. Um, any rebuttals or refuting of the other person's answer has to be included in your two minute or less time maximum. Because again, we ideally want you to use your time to answer the voters' questions and not argue against uh, the other person's point. I think many renters and landlords have questions about Prop 21. If you have one, please don't be shy, type it into the chat box so I can try to uh, ask Renee and Deborah. And we'll do our final Insta poll of the night after this Q&A to see how you would vote on Prop 21 based on what you just heard. So uh, we'll kick it off, and this one's going to start with Renee. Uh, this is a question from a Facebook contact of mine, a mid-20s voter in tech who rented in SF until he recently moved back into his parents' home. He was concerned about people without homes in San Francisco. Uh, both sides of Prop 21 are saying that they have renters' best interests in mind, so he wants to know from both of your perspectives what evidence do we have about how passing Prop 21 would affect homelessness in say a place like San Francisco? Renee, you can go ahead. That's a fantastic question. A, a study a couple of years ago by Zillow, the real estate firm showed that for every 5% increase in rents in the greater LA area, an additional 2000 people ended up homeless. Another study by Zillow also showed that when, that when the uh, median rents in a community were above 32%, then homelessness didn't just grow uh, at, a, at a fast pace. It started accelerating uh, to an uncontrollable level. Uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of the cities in the state of California are above that 32% threshold, uh, with an additional number of cities uh, currently at the level at which homelessness is triggered by increases in rent. And so the issue of rent control is important for that. We know 
that homelessness, if you look at the leading causes of it, we know that evictions and the inability to keep up with the rent are some of the biggest issues that drive homelessness. That's according to a study by the loss by LASA, which is the LA County agency that looks at the homeless. They have done these surveys over the years and come up with the same result. Again, that evictions and the inability to pay rent are driving factors in this. When we look at evictions, 90% of the reason uh, reasons why people end up being evicted have to do with the fact that they cannot continue to pay the rent. It is an inability to keep up with rent increases that leads the vast majority of people to get evicted. Uh, and of course, we know that 80% of those who are evicted are people of color. That is people like me. I'm Latino. It is African Americans. It is the very people who are being pushed out of our cities uh, as a result of this housing crisis. And for that reason, we know that we have to do far more to protect these 17 million renters in California, especially in our major cities who are kept currently unable to pay the rent. The majority of renters in California are struggling to pay the rent according to all federal guidelines and the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. That's why we need Prop 21. Thank you, Renee. Go ahead, Deborah. Uh, thank you, Jackie. So let me start by saying Proposition 21 does nothing to help our homeless situation here in California. It's a very challenging situation. But I'll tell you what we did do, or I'll tell you what the legislature did. They passed statewide rent control. The governor has indicated when he signed that, that it was the strongest form of rent control in the nation. So we do have, and the legislature has addressed the issue of capping rents in California. You know, what's fascinating is our homeless situation does continue to plague us in all of our cities. Um, you know, the governor and uh, local governments have spent millions of dollars to put homeless in hotels recently under COVID called Project Room Key. And yet, even with these millions of dollars, not to mention uh, Proposition 1, which we passed in uh, 2018, and Proposition 2 in 2018, six billion dollars for homelessness, and yet we still have people on the street. Uh, the legislature is asking what's going on with our local governments and their inability to answer the problem of mental health uh, and drug addiction. Um, we have also passed state laws to make it a uh, factor that owners cannot discriminate when somebody comes to them with a Section 8 vouchers. Uh, that's individuals who um, are low income and or veterans, and they need to use those vouchers. So we have done everything we can in California to address our homeless situation. The next issue that we really need to tackle is our drug addiction and our challenges we have with mental health here in California. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I'm gonna move it on to a question that is sort of the, the theme of the night which is we've seen these ballot measures before. So, so what's the difference this time? Lori Ludwig um, asked in our chat, how is this different than the previous proposition, Proposition 10 that was defeated in 2018? And, and I'm adding to her question here, what difference do those changes make in both of your uh, opinions? I'm gonna pass it off first to Deborah. Thank you, Jackie, that's a good question. Quite frankly, I think it's malpractice practice that we're back again. Uh, the measure was defeated by 20 percentage points in, in 2018. Even though the proponents will tell you uh, they made some changes with Proposition 21, what they did is they went to the heart of our state law. We have a state law that tells local governments, you can pass rent control, but you must do th three things. Um, you cannot pass it on new construction, meaning no strict forms of rent control like we see in San Francisco, for example. Uh, uh, units are capped at 1% annual rent increases. That's not even uh, equal to the consumer price index. The second thing that our state law says and, and that Proposition 21 uh, will uh, overturn is that they will impose rent control on single family homes. Now, Renee will tell you, no, they don't. <laughs> I will tell you, yes, they do. Basically, what you have is single family rental homes will be only exempt from Proposition 21 only exempt if you have two units, meaning the, own, the house you live in, and maybe the ADU or the granny unit in the back, and only if you own it as a natural person. That's not how we own rental housing and our own homes in California. In fact, uh, most people will own it as a family trust. So I will tell you that 
the 35% of the single family rentals in California will fall under rent control. And the third and most, I think, damaging part is they will overturn a state law that says uh, rental property owners will um, have their rents capped even at turnover. So we call that vacancy control. Today, rents have to be decontrolled at turnover. Proposition 21 says you can increase the rent up to 15% on your new uh, resident. But if you have a long-term resident, which many in rent control jurisdictions have, they've been there for 20 years, that's maybe a $100 rent increase. That doesn't even cover some of the basic maintenance. So those are the biggest changes, the big three parts of Proposition 21, quite frankly, do the same thing as Proposition 10 two years ago. Thanks, Deborah. I appreciate that. Renee, it's your turn. And, and the question again is, what's the difference between Prop 10 and Prop 21 today? And what I wanna actually, the differences have? Sure. I want to actually start by addressing a couple of things. I find it kind of scandalous that Deborah is claiming that we don't care about the homeless when the organization that I work for already has a thousand units of very low income housing in the city of L.A. and is about to break ground on an all affordable unit uh, uh, tower in the center of Los Angeles in the coming couple of years. We did not pass a rent control at the state level. Let's be very clear. It's why the very protections that Deb is talking about, that law that was passed has been, the authors of that bill have endorsed Proposition 21. That includes Assemblymember David Chu. It includes Assemblymember Richard Bloom down here in Southern California. And it includes uh, Assemblymember Rob Bonta. All of the co-sponsors of that statewide legislation do it. And the reason why is because they say that bill was not rent control. That was an anti-gouging law. So we have to be very clear. I do want to agree with something that Deb said, though. She said that billions are being spent every year to be able to do something about homelessness. But after it happens, the problem is that the pipeline to homelessness has been allowed to stay as wide as it has for so many years so that we keep on spending billions of dollars to try to treat a problem after it has happened. This is why the vast majority of the homeless are not mentally ill or suffering from drug addiction or alcohol addiction. They are on the streets again because of economic crises and the inability to pay the rent. This is why it's malpractice. I'd say that the CAA is a constant roadblock to real reforms. Again, going to the issue of what it is that our initiative does. In a nutshell, we are allowing for an expansion of rent control to single family homes for folks who have, again, up to two single uh, family homes uh, uh, under their name. That includes family trusts. Family trusts under the law are interpreted as being, again, if they are in particular going, the, the interest or the, the value of the property is going to one individual or one family, that means that that property can and will be interpreted as being uh, exempt under Prop 21. We're gonna be very clear, the same argument that Deb is saying about how our initiative doesn't protect single family homeowners, she made that case. They made the case in front of a court in Sacramento and the California Superior Court shot down that argument. And so again, we. Need to be uh, very truthful about this. We do okay, allow for an exemption for new construction as well. For sure. Move on to the next question. This question comes from Hannah Cleaner. Hannah asks, given that there is a shortage of rental units in California, how does Prop 21 impact the number of rental units that will be available? This is going to go to Renee first. Sure. Fantastic question. The honest to God truth is that precisely the inability to be able to build enough housing is what has actually led to the problem that we have right now. Again, it is why the primary sponsor of this initiative is building that housing for the very same reason. It's why we have been endorsed by the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing Developers, by the Healthy Housing Foundation, why we have been supported by, the, by Housing California, the nonprofit that has a lot of developers. Ultimately, uh, the USC Price Institute uh, they looked at uh, a longitudinal set of studies that looked at the effect of rent controls on new construction. The actual empirical evidence is that rent control has no impact on new construction, none whatsoever. The UC Berkeley Haas Institute looked at that same uh, uh, research and said the exact same thing. Increasingly, what we are seeing, the actual research shows not models, just looking at the data that rent control does not impact the construction of new housing. But I want to add one further point. Deb and uh, the California Apartment Association have been making claims that rent control is bad for California for decades. They made this argument when they uh, made sure to pass restrictions on rent control in 1995, and they promised 
that by limiting rent control in California, construction would suddenly boom across California. The actual end result was a 44% decrease in housing construction of apartments in particular uh, over the coming 15 year period. In fact, we have not built more apartment complexes in the state of California in the last 25 years since those restrictions on rent control were passed because we were promised that we would have a new, a new construction being built in the state of California, that did not happen. And so again, they have a track record of making claims about why you should not protect people to keep them in their homes. And so I say to the voters of California, we should err on the side of protecting people and not err on the side of uh, models and claims that have failed demonstrably over 25 years. Renee, thank you for that. Deborah, you're up. So Proposition 21 does nothing to provide new rental housing for California and in fact will make our housing situation worse. The same studies that I think Renee has read, as I have also, Berkeley, USC, and Stanford, they do say and they acknowledge the potential negative impact of development. We lost housing in San Francisco because of San Francisco's strict forms of rent control. The unintentional consequences, so says UZ Berkeley, of expanding rent control is not only significant declines in maintenance, but the removal of housing from the market, and they acknowledge the potential for the negative impacts of development. Now, all editorial boards, with the exception of one in California, have told the voters, vote no. And here's what they've said. Proposition 21 will worsen California's housing crisis. Proposition 21 will result in fewer rental units, making for an even tighter rental housing market. Proposition 21 will discourage builders from creating new rental housing. And Proposition 21, of course, we all know is the same bad measure as two years ago. It is also not means tested. And what I mean by that is that the wealthy also will take advantage and compete with uh, low income individuals for housing. We passed statewide rent control in 1995 because of that very reason. Um, we saw very negative impacts in the strict forms of rent controlled cities because they had moved out people of color and people who with single uh, head of households were mo moved out of those cities. Okay, thanks Deborah. We have time for one more question. Um, this question comes from Heather Young, and uh, this question gets at the point that Prop 21 uh, does not actually create a statewide rent control law, it, it rather allows lo localities to create expanded rent control. So Heather asks, why should or shouldn't local governments decide for themselves whether they want rent control or not? I'm going to go to Deb first. That's a very good question. So. Um, we know that rent control cities can do rent control today. That's allowed by state law. Most of these cities have already said and have written into their statute, if and when proposition, a proposition, whether it was 10 or 21 passes, we will match what the proposition allows. It also does not necessarily give local control to jurisdictions. And why, let me tell you why I say that. Um, the League of Cities has not taken a support position on this because what they know is that even if a local jurisdiction decides not to pass a strict form of rent control, that the voters, meaning the tenant groups, may do so and take the control away from what the local governments believe to be bad policy. We're seeing that in Sacramento today. So the Sacramento city passed rent control. The tenant groups didn't like it. They're taking it to the ballot and it will be a much more stringent and worse form of rent control. All of the city officials, it's a very progressive city council, have opined that they, the voters should vote no on that. So we're going to see um, much more stringent rent control, whether or not the local city and county officials like it or not, because there will be another battle at the local level to pass strict forms of rent control. It is not good for our cities. It is not good for housing production and is not good for our homeless population. Your turn, Renee. Well, I mean, the answer is simple. The reason why local, uh, local cities should get the right to determine what they need is because they know what is best for their cities, right? It's why, by the way, we have now of supervisors. We have been endorsed by the city of West Hollywood. We've been endorsed by the city of Santa Monica. We were just endorsed by Monterey County uh, earlier this year, about five months ago. The city of Los Angeles 
asked the, the governor of California and the state legislature to pass emergency protections to expand rent control so that the city of LA could expand rent control. Deb says that cities already have the opportunity to do rent control in their cities. The actual fact of the matter is that if you live in San Francisco, your city council, your board of supervisors cannot pass rent control on anything that was built after 1979. They can't do it because of a law that Deborah Carlton's institute organization, the California Apartment Association, drafted 25 years ago and got passed through the legislature. Because of that, San Francisco, even though it wants to, cannot pass more rent control. The city of Los Angeles has on multiple occasions said that it wants to expand its, its rent control ordinance. It could not do that after 1978. If you live in an apartment built in 1979 in LA, you do not have rent control. You cannot have rent control. If you are living in an apartment complex built in 1978, you can have rent control. That is an arbitrary uh, law. What that has actually resulted, by the way, is in the destruction of, of rent controlled units in our cities. The number of cities or sorry, the number of, of uh, rent controlled units in our city of Los Angeles, for example, has fallen by something like 30 percent since that law was passed 25 years ago, precisely because that law was meant to uh, eliminate rent control. It's why the Los Angeles Times in 1995 said that that law was meant to destroy rent control. What we are simply saying is give the power back to the people. And I want to close specifically to defend the initiative uh, in Sacramento by saying this. The people of Sacramento have the right to be able to determine and vote uh, uh, democratically for an initiative that they want. That is an absolutely correct thing to do. The people of California have the right to be able to vote on these matters, and that is fantastic that people can do it. On top of the fact that the existing rent, uh, control ordinance in Sacramento, that ordinance, which is very important, that ordinance Renee, is weaker I need to than actually the state cut you law. Off right now. Sure. Thank you so much. This is a this is a tricky one. Complex topics. Great questions from the audience and really thorough answers. Um, voters, you can go ahead and take the Zoom poll. Vote yes or no. We're still not sure on Prop 21 right now, and we will see the results on the closing screen before we all click on leave meeting. Renee and Deborah, thank you very much for taking the time to join us and talk about rent control and Prop 21 in a way that makes uh, more sense for all of us to understand. And thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us for tonight's event. Uh, special thanks to those of you who tuned in for two or more or all of the props to you events we did. If you didn't catch them all the first time, all the videos are on the CalMatters YouTube page and also at our website at calmatters.org slash events. Please don't forget to vote. Besides these events and our explained in one minute videos, we've got a great voter guide with more info about election 2020 in California and help us keep things like our voter guide, videos, events, and overall coverage of California policy and politics. Uh, uh, consider becoming a donor or a member and giving us some financial support by going to our website and making a donation at calmatters.org. Good night, everyone. Thanks again for joining us and stay strong, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.